What did the new term us uh, and the entire nation about to independence? Yes. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, we'll start first of all from 1884 mm -hmm. when uh, Namibia was annexed to Germany. Mm -hmm. And then uh, other countries also in <coughs> Africa were given to the colonial powers mm -hmm. like Britain. Germany, uh, Portugal, and uh, Italy. Uh, like here in Africa, if we look first at the Sadek countries, mm. Britain colonized uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and lastly in Tanzania. That is in Sadek. But there are also countries like Ghana, uh, and uh, Nigeria mm. and Kenya, Uganda, which were colonized by Britain. Then uh, Portugal took Mozambique and Angola. Mm. That's why they speak Portuguese in those countries. Mm. And then the French, they took most of the Central Africa countries like uh, DRC, Equatorial Guinea, Cameroon, and all those are to West Africa there. Those uh, which are French speaking today. These were colonized by France. Mm. Then Germany uh, took Namibia. Then uh, they wanted also to have Tanzania uh, and also part of uh, Cameroon. These were the countries which were colonized by Germany. Mm -hmm. Then uh, later on, uh, Tanzania was given to, to, to Britain. Uh, that's why the, this region was uh, named Caprivi, because the Germans, they wanted a route to connect uh, Southwest Africa to Tanzania, that was called German East Africa by then, before Britain came in, in Tanzania. So the, this word Caprivi, Caprivi, von Caprivi was the German Chancellor from 1886 to 1889. And then when the Germans came to Namibia, there was resistance because they landed at uh, Ludris. There was a resistance from the Namas uh, and also the Hereros. Mm -hmm. That's why we have that genocide of 1904 to 1908. People were resisting colonialism. Because of uh, a poor ammunition, I mean arms, our people do not have arms to fight against Germans. They were defeated. And then, now, which people are you talking about? We are now? talking about the Namas and the Hereros. They didn't have enough or they didn't have, uh, weapons to fight against the German army, which mm. was here in mm. Namibia. Mm. Mm. So they were defeated in 1908. Some of these Namas and the Hereros had to cross the borders to Botswana and South Africa. We have Namas and the Hereros in Botswana today, and also in South Africa because of that war. It was uh, General von Trotter who gave the order of exterminating the Hereros, that they, uh, they were stubborn, they must be killed. So they were led into the Kalahari Desert. Some of them died of hunger, of bullets, of wounds, and all these things. And even thirst, because it's a desert. Those who managed, they crossed over to Botswana. That's why we are saying the Namibian heroes in Botswana, they are allowed to return to Namibia. 
even the last week, the Minister of Home Affairs announced in Parliament that uh, there are 1,000 heroes in Botswana who have already registered themselves to return to Namibia. Uh, independence is something that uh, we wanted as Africans. As we know, the likes of Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, Nehru of Egypt, uh, Dr. Kaunda, Dr. Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, uh, Chomo Kenyatta of Kenya. All these were people who led the African people to mobilize that we should shake the colonial chains so that we become independent. And here in Namibia, uh, the father of the nation, Dr. Sam Yuma, who started organizing with other Namibians in the names of uh, the late Toivo Yatoivo, may his soul rest in peace, and many others to organize the Namibian people so that uh, they resist the colonialism. First of all, they started negotiating on the table, around the table, so that the South Africans could give us our independence. But uh, the South Africans could not understand that language. That's why Swapo decided to form up an army. First of all, that army was called Southwest Africa Liberation Army, Swanla. Swala. 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 That was the first from 1966 to 1972. It was called Swala. From 1972, it was changed because, because of the names of West Africa. Now it was changed. 1968, the name Namibia came in. So we changed the Swala to the People's Liberation Army of Namibia plan. So this is the army which was created in 1966. So Dr. Sam Nyoma, the founding father, left this country in 1959. He went through Botswana uh, to, to, to Tanzania and then the whole world to mobilize for support for the liberation or independence of Namibia. So. The army was created as the voice of the Namibian people to fight against the South African regime, which was a, a colony here in Namibia. Uh, the first battle was at Omuwombashe. Omuwombashe is where we have the shrine today in Omsata region on 26 August 1966. After that, most of the battles were fought here in the Zambeza region. Uh, from 1968, it was so much intensified up to, say, up to 1979. Uh, some of us joined the People's Liberation Army of Namibia in 1975. And we also continued fighting here in Zambezi region, from Singalamwe, Kamenga, to Katima Mulirohi. We destroyed the many camps at Kamenga, Mukwa, and uh, we attacked also Katima Mulirohi twice. One in 1977, and the other one, the biggest attack, was on the 23rd of August, 1978. That was the attack which was known by everybody. People were running around. Some from Manila informed themselves of Tongola. Those from the land informed themselves of Tongola. Those who were just jumping in every car they could see. So we are sorry for that, but the aim was independence. Uh, independence, as you have asked, is for people who have freedoms freedom of movement, freedom of speech, to have rights as human beings, not to be colonized by another person. 
That's what we call independence. Okay. When you control your own economy, when you control the political affairs of your country, you have social freedom to do everything that you want in your country. All right. That's, uh, that's uh, independence. Mm -hmm. The years I've been in exile, the years we were involved in an armed struggle, I must say that the president is a very good fighter. Very good. Once he's given, he's shown the equipment that he should use. The Caprivian can be very brave. Now, come independence, the Namibian government didn't know quite how to handle this. No African government knows how to handle tribalism. What they do is have a knee-jerk reaction. So whenever people ask, why, why are you treating us this way? It's a sessionist. So, uh, to take you back a bit, what happened during those year, years when we were fighting? Uh, during those years when we were fighting, first of all, Namibians were mobilized to go into exile and form up a strong army. Uh, that army was supported by the that time, we can say, communist countries or socialist countries in the East. That is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republic, USSSR, then is the Russian Federation, after other countries in 1989. Countries like Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, the People's Republic of China, Republic of Cuba and uh, Nigeria, and then the frontline states that is Angola, Zambia, Zambia, Mozambique, Tanzania. These were the frontline states. These countries they give us weapons and ammunition different animals for us to carry out their own struggle effectively. Uh, they supported us with uniforms, boots, they supported us with clothes for those who were not soldiers. They put on clothes in the, the camps in Swapo, both in Angola and Zambia. They supported us with food and also with providing us with uh, scholarships for Namibians to study abroad mm -hmm. because Swapo was prepared to be a government. Mm -hmm. So we were not only fighting, some were sent to schools so that when we, when we take over the government, we have administrators mm -hmm. both in the economy, in administration, and all sectors of the government. Mm -hmm. How did you join the liberation struggle? Uh, as a person. Yes, yourself. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was studying at uh, a previous secondary school and then politics started. We used to listen from the Swabo radio. It was uh, broadcasting from Osaka. Then at, in the hostel, there was someone in the radio who used to go there to listen from 10 o'clock to uh, evening hours. So we mobilized ourselves, we started to mobilize also other schools, other youth, and even teachers and workers. So that's how we went in mass. Uh, that time, say, the, this region, when we met in Livingston from June to September, we were more than 500. Mm -hmm. Just from uh, this oh, yes, region. from this region. How old were you by that time? I was 20 years old by then, mm -hmm. in 1975. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's how we organized ourselves, uh, mobilizing each other. Mm -hmm. I was even arrested here uh, by, by the South African police. We were seven, those who were arrested because of mobilization. Mm -hmm. It was the late Lavno Palazzo. Uh, late Chris Mazira, hey, they all late. Late Bartholomew Mera Papi, 
There's another comrade, Delamo. I don't know where he is, but we went together. Uh, the only people who are alive is only me and uh, comrade uh, Bernard Kalokera from Sokotan in that group of seven who were arrested. So after we were released, we spent only one day and then we left the country. Mm -hmm. so, And then we just thought it was just an extension of the South African Defense Force. Uh, but uh, when I've come back, I've seen that it's almost an independent battalion on its own. And it has, it's doing a wonderful job among the people of the Caprivi. I think uh, the existence of a regional force here in the Caprivi is a necessity uh, for in the future when there will be balances, you know, in the uh, Namibian, you know, uh, power structure. You see, this force also will act, you know, as a uh, a force that will be looked at, you know, as coming from this particular region, which is the capital. In the People's Liberation Movement in Swap in exile. Okay. Yes. For how long did you spend? Uh, I Asia? spent, uh, let's say, after training in Zambia. Training. Uh, I, I, we were brought here to start fighting uh, with many others uh, up to 1978. After Katima Miro attack here, I was chosen with the other nine comrades who were 10. We were sent for further military training in uh, Tanzania. Then we came back in 1979 in Lusaka in June. 19, uh, in August 1979, we were transferred to Angola. Then I joined also the ranks and files of the People's Liberation Army of fighting from Angola into Namibia on that side. So in Zambia, I stayed for say four years, and uh, then in Angola, I stayed for say it's 10 years so all in all I stayed 14 years in exile mm. uh, take you back again mm. you talked to us for uh, 1966 what happened on that day yeah according to history and also for the people because there are still some people who are alive today mm. uh, who are telling us what happened that day uh, what happened was that uh, the commander-in-chief of the People's Liberation Army of Namibia, uh, the founding father, sent nine combatants, planned combatants, from Tanzania right, to come on foot through Zambia, through Kavango, to the former of Ambuland. Then they established a camp there at Ongurumbashe. Uh, the aim of that camp was for those soldiers to train Namibians inside the country. The aim was to arm the Namibian people, those who were mobilized, who had a uh, will, who were willing to join the liberation struggle inside Namibia so that they could be armed so that the war could start inside Namibia. That was the plan. Mm. But uh, because, you know, in war there are always spies and all these things, someone reported them, reported that base with Mbashi. Then... Among us, the group? Uh, no, we supporters. don't know. Uh, we don't know whether it's amongst the group, or, uh, but maybe, maybe from the supporters. Because because the ways they were there, they were being fed by the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe they from the community. We don't know really who, who reported them. Then the base was attacked. 
early morning hours of 26 August 1966. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. How many died there? Hmm? How many died? Mm, I can't remember, but uh, there are those who survived. Some were captured, like uh, their, their commander, uh, Commander Nankudu, who was also, after seven years in Robben Island, he even became a, a councillor in Wendu, the Commerce region. Then he passed on recently as a, a councillor. So there are still many of them who are still alive. Now, by that time, where was the group of uh, the late uh, Mr. Or Comrade uh, Brendan Simboy? Uh, I, that is a sad story of Comrade Brendan Simboy. Uh, Bren Comrade Brendan Simboy was arrested in 1964 at Mafulohi, as we understand, and then he was taken, some they say he was taken to uh, Karasberg, and then later on he was taken to Opo, even when he, they brought him here in 1972, he was coming from Opo, that's where he was uh, uh, put in prison. After that visit, he was brought here to come and uh, see his mother uh, in 1972. After that, we don't have any information of what happened. Mm -hmm. Yes. We don't look at them only as a deterrent to trouble, but we look at them as a force that is there to help the people of Brevi. The force that is there to protect the people of The force that is there really, if there's any intended ex external attack, so that the 701 will be able to be there to protect the lives of the people. Of the world. You understand how complex the history is of this area. It must be managed very, very carefully. It is only 1964 that Kanu and uh, my uncle, Mishak Muyongo, joined Swapo. It was a very, very delicate arrangement. Yeah? The Swapo at the time needed Caprivi in order to launch a war from here. It is closer to Zambia. Yeah? Now, why did the struggle take so long? Uh, the struggle took so long because the South African government was uh, a very had a very strong army. You know, we as blind combatants, we had to, to carry our arms and ammunition on shoulders. Those ones they were having uh, vehicles, military vehicles. They had uh, military planes and all these things. Yeah, but uh, since we were determined to get our independence, we had to fight against that army. Mm -hmm. I remember the former commander of the South African Army, I mean South African Defense Force, uh, what is his name again? Uh, General Shu, okay, the, the name is gone. He said that the Swapo combatants were very strong, cannot be, com their, their fighting capability cannot be compared by any army in Sadek, in Sadek here. He, he said that it was, we were giving very strong uh, attacks and uh, 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 as a leading force in the liberation struggle, they f really faced a, a very strong enemy. And we were also facing a very strong enemy. That's why the struggle was protracted for so long. Mm. Yes. And how did the United Nations now came in? Yes, the, that was on the, the we, we as a, a liberation movement, we were fighting three fronts. There is the political front, the diplomatic front, and the military front. Political front was there to mobilize the world over 
to support our liberation struggle. The diplomatic front is where uh, we were also trying to engage the South African government to come to a negotiating table. And because this, they were refusing to talk to us, but the military front was forcing them. Even the South African women, if you remember, in 1986, they demonstrated against their own government that their children are being sent to war and being killed. That was another force also uh, inside the enemy. That was forcing the enemy to go to a negotiating table. Mm -hmm. So the United Nations all along was supporting and up to now still supporting Namibia. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and the Kanu people wanted to grow but there were certain things they did not discuss in that arrangement. For instance, if Meshek Muyongo started to talk about treating Caprivi with the delicacy that it required, he should have started in 1989. Who did it well? The person who did it well was Chief Dirhat from the Rio Bot. Chief Dirhat said, no, we want to be treated differently from other people because we are bastards. The mistake Muyongo made is not to say it early enough until he was hurting himself. So he was an opportunist. If he started to say, my people, our history is different. We were not treated like this before. We were not quite part of the Southwest Africa. We need to include in our package of independence some agreement, some understanding that because Caprivi was neglected, was abused more than other people, they must be treated in a, in a particular way. For young people to join the battalion, because we know the future is maybe a bad one, and if they are there, if they are in the army, and even in the combined Southwest African army, we will know that we have our representatives there, that will defend us you know, in case of uh, problems. Uh, so for cannot fight in the Caprivians because a lot of those Caprivians were there when we left all of them came. Very few left. And I must admit those who were remained behind are there against their will. If they were given the chance, if they were not in Angola so to speak, some of them would have come back. People say there are swap of people still in the Caprivian. And uh, I think more in the school. That is a man so what have you, which is an affiliate of so Again, let me put it this way. So people here, they don't understand what is all about Swap. They have, let me put it this way, very romantic view about Swap. If they get to know what Swap is, I think some of them won't be members of Swap. I've said it to a number of people. If you want to know about Swap, talk to me, ask me, I'll tell you. Why? We had to leave. Because once you are involved in a struggle, and that struggle relieves the mainstream of the struggle and the concentration on its own turning against its own people, those who are involved in the struggle, then that struggle has lost its meaning. And that's why we have to leave. Swapo. However, Swapo is vigilant. Swapo is vigilant. If we fought for the last 17 years, we have the vigor and stamina to fight for another 17 years, double that, even 50 years, even 100 years. Some of us will be happy to die in the struggle, but to make sure we build a stronger foundation upon which a white man will be smashed, a fascist will be slashed to pieces, and the genuine freedom and independence will be achieved. United Nations uh, recognized Swapo as the sole and the honor representative of the Namibian people. Mm. And then, as such, 
Many negotiations were conducted. You remember the five Western countries who were also trying to negotiate on, with Swapo and South Africa so that uh, South Africa could give independence to Namibia. And also these Western countries, the five Western countries, they were somehow involved in convincing South Africa to talk to Swapo. So that's how negotiations came in. I think what we should we look at is the Namibian people, as I said earlier during my press conference, had expected that South Africans were not sincere with the five Western countries. South Africans were not sincere with the United Nations. They just wanted to look for a loophole that they would use as, a, as an, an excuse not to cooperate with the UN. Now, they found some loopholes, according to them, uh, the 7,500 troops mentioned in the report of the Secretary General, the, the, the question of the police, and the question of the date. But in actual fact, this is a scheme that was already arranged. If people can remember, 1975, when they put together the Town Hall uh, uh, group, that was really geared to implement the Town Hall Constitution, which would mean to set up a puppet government in Namibia that will be controlled from Pretoria. So really, what, what we are saying now is the South Africans have come out in their true colors. They now uh, tell us that they are not ready to risk a defeat at the post in a democratic elections at the hands of Swapo. That much they know. I think talking to the UN personnel who were in Namibia, who had uh, the chance to talk to some of the uh, South African staff in Namibia, they were in private confirming that in, in true essence, Swapo has the support and can win elections. So the South Africans are scared of that, that with their many there, uh, the UN uh, organized the election, supervising it, then Swapo will win it. It will be an embarrassment to them. We know the Boers are armed to the chief. It's even said that the Americans have given them technical knowledge and know-how to produce the atom bombs. But in any people's war, it is not the armament that is a decisive factor in a people's war. It is the people's willingness to make sacrifices and to use, of course, the, cor the correct uh, guerrilla warfare scientifically in order to smash the enemy. The Boers cannot fire the atom bomb in the window. They will kill themselves. Atom bomb also contain the poisonous radioaction. They will die themselves today. They will die. They cannot fire it in Johannesburg. We will fight today in Johannesburg today. We will fight today in the window today. <laughs> of course, the fight will end up in the defeat of the Boers. They are only in a position to postpone the day of the reckoning, the day of their defeat. It will come and is moving rapidly, particularly in Namibia, because I'm the chief in command and I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Namibia is a god gift country. We have no other one except the Namibia, and we have to be there. Those who are trying to stand on our way to freedom, it's obvious we will smash them to pieces. We will smash them to pieces. Whether Botha Regan want it or not, Namibia shall be free. We will seize it from the hands of the Boers. And the Regan is not in a position to send the troops. We know he sent the mercenaries and the weapons to the Boers. But those weapons are fired by human beings. The more the Boers are remaining in Namibia, every day plan will, sh will kill two, maybe five, and the year, there will definitely be more Boers killed. <laughs> Therefore, comrades, uh, in this difficult struggle, we must console ourselves, we must maintain unity of purpose and action, we must remain vigilant,
and discipline too. And we must have respect among ourselves. A nation without respect among its ranks and file will never be able to stand on its own feet, let alone fighting a fascist regime like that to border and defeat it. Therefore, unity here is the sharp weapon. Unit is the sharp weapon. Next to a gun, even if you have a gun, you have no morale around those puppets. The boys have trained thousands of puppets, including a mercenary. But even they admit the fact that one swap combatant is worth a hundred South African soldiers. Is this true? Because he or she, she has the morale and she knows that she is fighting for a right cause. And those ones, puppets, they are bribed with the money. They are fighting for money. They are selling the country for money. How do you sell a country for money? A country is for the people. It's there to stay. In fact, Namibia doesn't belong to us alone. Namibia belongs to the African continent. It belongs to Zambia. It belongs to Angola. It belongs to Algeria. In as much as Zambia belongs to us. Swapo is fully committed to the peaceful plan. To live in peace with our neighbors. And uh, I think, uh, for instance, uh, Zambia and ourselves, if the peace that is existing here in the Capribi or in between our, our countries were not there, the border that we are using now would not be possible. But we would like to warn that uh, this border should not be used you know, incorrectly by, say, uh, certain people trying to carry messages from Swapo to here so that they destabilize this place. Otherwise, I think, you know, it's a good thing that uh, the two countries should live in peace. And given the fact that in the Capri at the moment there is no fighting which is going on, it's very peaceful here in the Capri, I think it's better for us to, you know, to show our neighboring countries that we have no evil intentions whatsoever. If anything, we want a good neighborliness, which we should be able to, to live together with them. We must give them the, the, the idea or the picture that all we want is interdependence with our neighboring countries. One can just imagine what tensions he must have experienced and must be very relieved that it's all over. And on the face of our present elect, the president, the president of the Republic of Namibia, distinguished dignitaries, it is now my own and pleasure to call upon the Secretary General of the United Nations, Dr. Harvey Perez de Cuella, to swear in the President of the Republic of Namibia. The Secretary General. Mr. Niyomo's last few moments as President-elect of the Republic of Namibia. To be sworn in by the Secretary-General of the United Nations. Your Excellency, it is a great pleasure and honor for me in my capacity as Secretary-General of the United Nations to administer to you the oath of your high office in terms of Article 30 of the Constitution of the Republic of Namibia. Could you therefore place your left hand on the Constitution which is before you and repeat after me. 
I, Sam Nujoma, do hereby swear. I, Sam Nujoma, do hereby swear that I will strive to the best of my ability. That I will strive to the best of my ability to uphold, protect, and to defend as the supreme law. To uphold, protect, and defend as the supreme law. The Constitution of the Republic of Namibia. The Constitution of the Republic of Namibia. And faithfully to obey and execute. And faithfully to obey and execute. And administer the laws of the Republic of Namibia. And administer the laws of the Republic of Namibia. That I will protect the independence, sovereignty. That I will protect the independence, sovereignty. Territorial integrity and the material and spiritual resources of the Republic of Namibia. Territorial integrity and the material and spiritual resources of the Republic of Namibia. And that I will endeavor to the best of my ability. And that I will endeavor to the best of my ability to ensure justice for all the inhabitants of the Republic of Namibia. To ensure justice for all the inhabitants of the Republic of Namibia. So help me God. So help me God. May I now ask Your Excellency to sign the oath you have just taken, whereafter I shall also sign it. now extend my very heartiest congratulations to you on assuming your high office. Distinguished Thank you. 